But when I study it, I see that whenever something seems off, if you believe it's God's preserved word, then you will find a revelation. The skip, skeptics mm. will find a mistake. You will find a revelation. And I can tell you that in these last two years, we have seen things that I had never seen p- before. I think the depth of what God has preserved in the King James Bible is unfathomable. You have no need to compromise. This is God's hand. God's hand is all over this thing. And trust it, believe it, preach it. Hi, I'm Brandon Briscoe, and welcome to another episode of The Postscript. Living Faith Bible Institute's weekly podcast and YouTube series devoted to interviewing pastors and professors from LFBI and across the Living Faith Fellowship. Since the end of the 19th century, the church has been debating an issue that before that era was not broadly contended, namely, whether or not God had faithfully preserved his word over time and between languages. For millennia, Psalm 12, 6, and 7 was understood to mean that God could and would protect and preserve His scriptures. It reads, The words of the Lord are pure words, tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. But by the late 1800s, modern academia had given rise to the critical text position, which would postulate that the Bible that we have is not the Bible that God had inspired. Today, the commonly held position is that God's word was captured in the original manuscripts, but was lost over time by the unreliable hands of transcribers and the inherent shortcomings of the translation process. The result of this critical view has led to an emphasis on scholarship. The archaeological, anthropological, and theological pursuit of the oldest and most eclectic text to produce the most thoughtful translation. This appeal to authority has led to an ever-expanding array of Bible translations in English as well as other languages, translations for which the scholars cannot definitively say are the very words of God. Today on the show, we have Arian Vogli, a man on a mission to create a reliable translation of the Bible in his native Albanian language. Now, what gives him this confidence that this is even possible in light of what we just got done talking about? What are his methods and how can he know that he has a steadfast approach to translating God's very words? And so with that, I want to welcome Arian to the show. Thank you so much for being with us, brother. Thank you for having me. This uh, last mission focus, we had an opportunity to have you come and speak a little bit about uh, what God's been doing in your life and the ministry that uh, that you are pursuing and, and the investment that you're making in this translation. And I can't wait to share that with the group. But before we get started, I really would love to hear about your salvation, your testimony of salvation. I think it's fascinating. And I think especially for for Americans uh, to hear that story is uh, inspiring and it's, and it's challenging. And so uh, do you mind sharing us uh, with us just a little bit about how you came to know Christ and what that looked like being in Albania? Sure. Absolutely. So Albania is a very little country in uh, Eastern Europe. So I wouldn't expect uh, most people to know much about its history. Uh, So it's right in between Italy and Greece. And so it's uh, there's a lot of history with that country. But the most recent history is that after World War II, Albania sided with the Eastern Bloc. So it was under communism from uh, from 44 to 1991. So I was born in, in 75 in Albania. So I, I grew up as a kid under communism, obviously didn't have much understanding of, of the politics. But, uh, you know, obviously there's a lot of propaganda. Everything is about propaganda. So, you, you know, I was brought up in, in schools that, that taught atheism and evolution. And the same thing was uh, taught at, at home. And so when the changes, I was about 15 when uh, everything started to, to change politically. Uh, the Berlin Wall had, had fallen and Albania was the last communist country in Europe to, to fall. And I was very much brainwashed into believing everything I had been taught. So when 
the changes happened. It was it was the the talk of the day was uh, freedom of speech and freedom of, of religion, and so this was our our daily conversation at, at school with with friends. Was you know was was is there a god? Is is you know what have we been lied about during communism? And is this thing true? We so we had to reevaluate everything that we had we had been taught. Obviously, we had been lied about many things, but that didn't mean that we were lied about everything. So this was uh, a daily topic of discussion, and I was very adamant that you know atheism was was right. There was no God, and very passionate uh, about it. And this in the summer of ninety two. Uh, Decatur Baptist Church from Decatur, Alabama, sent a team to the country to investigate what's going on. This is prior to Internet days. And Albania was very mm. isolated, very harsh form of, of communism, even harsher than, than some of the most communist countries. So very isolated. Nobody could go in and out of the country. They would scramble the waves so you couldn't get the, uh, anything in TV and, and radio. So we didn't know what's going on uh, outside of Albania. And other countries didn't know what's going on inside of Albania, so very little information. So Decatur Baptist sends a team, and they stay for about two weeks. And on that team, uh, Jeff Bartel uh, was on that team. He was at Decatur Baptist at the time. And, uh, you know, they saw the devastation of the country, what communism had done for 50 years in, in Albania, and they saw the need for, for the gospel. So here's, you know, all of a sudden we have freedoms. We don't know what to do with them. We can speak openly, uh, but there's there's no gospel in the country. So uh, a month later, Jeff arrived in Albania permanently. So he went back home and, you know, they talked to, to, to his pastor and they said, you know, the need is great. We need to do something. And they were very supportive and they sent him out. So in the, in a month, he was he had finished all of his business here, quit his job, sold his house and just moved to, to Albania. And then he started the, the first uh Mm. A Baptist Bible believing church in in the country, and uh, so I came in contact with Jeff through my sister because she was a, a translator. She was studying English at at the time, and for the next I would say six months probably, I met with Jeff almost every day, and uh, we were talking wow. about you know God and and I, I had a lot of questions. Now we had been taught under communism that you know only ignorant people believe in God because they don't have enough scientific knowledge to understand the physical phenomena in the in the universe, in the nature. So they have to resort to this. So he shattered my expectations because Jeff was an engineer. He was he was very well read. And so it made me think about, you know, well, maybe we had been lied about this, too. So I was open to listen to the other side of the story. And so it really took me several months just to meet with Jeff daily. And he was very, very patient with me, answering all my questions. And it made an impression on me that for every question that I had, he would say, well, let's let's open the Bible. Let's see what God has to say about that. Every single question. And I thought this guy knew the Bible by heart. Now, granted, most of my questions were probably very easy <laughs> at, at, at the time, uh, very, very fundamental about the faith. But. To me, it made an impression that, wow, somebody can just open the Bible and this book has all the answers, every answer, mm. every question that I have. He's able to point me to what God says. And so that made an impression on me. And so after a few months of uh, talking to him, this was January of 93, I, I, I realized that the Lord had been working on, on my heart to reveal himself to me and to reveal the word of God and the truth of what Christ did on the cross for, for my sins. And so that's when I came to him in faith and, and got saved in January of, of 93. Um, amazing. A uh, wonderful thing. And, uh, and a lot in your life has changed. Um, how long ago was it that you moved to the States and, and started uh, doing ministry here in the States? My wife and I moved here uh, in uh, 98 to go to college. So we finished a uh, college here in the States and then we were involved in church planting. And then when we went back for uh, some years, seven years uh, in 2014 uh, and then worked there with the church plant there and with a, with a main, with a main church in, in Tirana with discipleship and uh, teaching the Bible, uh, the Bible school there. And then in 2000. 21, we moved back to the States. 
And so now what are you doing? Uh, you're a member at Oakland Heights Baptist Church. You're in Cartersville, Georgia. And uh, maybe just briefly explain what that's been like and what the intention uh, of being here and, and, the, and the ministry that you're devoting yourself to introduce us to that just a little bit. In the early days, we when I got, when I got saved, we, we didn't have a Bible. When I was in in, in uh, high school, uh, when the changes in in the country happened, I wanted to get a hold of a Bible so I can make fun of it and I can make fun of my friends, but I couldn't find one. There was no Bibles in mm. in in the country. So when I got saved, we didn't have a Bible. Uh, we had one. New Testament that had just been translated from uh, Good News from Modern Man, uh, terrible translation, you know, paraphrased mm. and, and all of that. But that's that's all we had. So we we had been praying since 19, 1992 for God to give us his his words, his pure words in Albanian. There was a uh, old translation of the New Testament uh, done in the 1800s, a great, great work. Uh by a man who, who at, at the time was translated in uh, conjunction with uh, the London Bible Society. They were sponsoring the, the, the project, but he was not able to finish the, the Old Testament. And the Albanian language has changed a lot since then. So it would be like reading Wycliffe, you know, for, for the English uh, speakers. Mm. You, you can mm -hmm. make sense of what it's saying, but it wouldn't be your, your daily read. Uh, but even mm -hmm. that wasn't available. It existed in, in the national uh library, but we didn't have access to it. So in 1994, we got our first Albanian Bible, a translation that was done by a Swiss group uh, from the Nuova Diodati, the Italian, uh, it would be like the New King James, uh, close to mm -hmm. in, in, in English. And that was a translation that was done in, in record time uh, with un the understanding that there is an immediate need. People are getting saved. They don't have anything to read. So it was, it was a work that was done in haste given the certain uh, circumstances, but, but also with an understanding that, you know, later on it would need to be revised uh, anyway. Uh, the, the problem at the time with the translation was, was that there were people that knew language as well, but there weren't any mature Christians. You, you can find anybody that had been saved for more than a year or a few months. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so they didn't have the maturity to understand, you know, the depth of what it requires to, to produce a, a translation. So there was a mm -hmm. tremendous effort, a lot of work done. But throughout the years, you know, they, they uh, were open to making an, an update, a revision to that. Uh, it just never, never came to, to fruition. And so we had been praying and, and Jeff worked tirelessly for many years with them giving them uh, verses and words to, you know, to consider in the update. It just came, never came to fruition. And after many, many years of these, we kept asking God, why, why don't you give us something in, in our language? Have, bring mm -hmm. us somebody that will do this work. And, uh, you know, and then this, this was in around 2019 uh, when we looked around and said, well, what would it take for somebody to take on this work? So we made a long list of things that somebody would need to have the qualifications and the abilities to make this work. And uh, we found that God had gifted us with, with those resources. And so, you know, mm -hmm. we, we, we prayed and considered, and then uh, the Lord directed us to start this work. What were some of those things on your list, things that, that you felt like were necessary to, to have in, in terms of resource and knowledge to move forward with the work? So the, the the first thing, of course, is is knowledge of the language. You ha you have to be good at the language you're translating from. You have to have a working knowledge of the language, not just a book uh, knowledge uh, or an academic knowledge, but re really have an understanding of how language works. Uh, you also need to have a very good understanding of the Bible. You have to be grounded in sound doctrine. We have seen many examples of translations that come from people who, who are good at languages, but they don't, are, they're not solid in mm -hmm. their Bible understanding. Therefore, they make choices in, in decisions in translation that do not, uh, are not the best when it comes to sound doctrine. And they make elementary yeah. mistakes because they don't understand what the verse is saying, even though they understand the, the, the language. They're prone to presupposition. So you bring that to the table and your opinions begin to um, eisegetically inform what you translate, I suppose. Absolutely. 
Absolutely, because there there is a lot of leeway in translation. And so if you don't have a solid foundation in, in sound doctrine, you are going to make mistakes. That That's inevitable. So, mm-hmm. so those were the, the fundamental things we needed. We needed some, some skills, computer skills, you know, how to work with computers and, and databases and, and things like that to facilitate making this work. And we consider record time. Uh, so, you know, we, we checked, checked everything on the list, checked off. It was funny because my, my, my wife, um, she studied theater in, in, in college. And at the time she didn't know why, and, and other people didn't know why, uh, you know, she would take that choice. We had a lot of people tell us, pastors included, tell us, no, you shouldn't (laughs) do that. That's of the devil. You know, you shouldn't go in the arts and all of that. But her, her field of expertise was studying Shakespeare. And so, so she translated, even later on in life, she translated Shakespeare and Shakespeare plays and put on Shakespeare plays. And the number of people in Albania that have dared to translate Shakespeare are maybe two altogether in, in our history, because it's very difficult to understand wow. him and to understand the context of the time besides the, the, the language. And so all of that was preparation for what we were going to need for, for our work. Amazing. Now, uh, one of the things that I, I really want to, you know, um, share with the audience is how unconventional, unconventional in the broader sense, uh, your translation approach has been. In other words, there are many, there are many groups that are doing translation work all over the world uh, in many, many different languages. But, but your, your approach has been interesting. Now, c- can you explain your philosophy and how it might be different from from other methods and uh, and forms of translation. Sure. So you know, in our research about Bible translations, we found out that the method that most people take to translate the Bible is start with a book, certain book of the Bible, usually the the Gospels, and then make their way through each book of the Bible. Now, our concern with taking that approach is that this method. It's very hard to keep track of individual words, how you're translating individual words without having to repeat yourself and and repeat the work over and over uh, again. And because we believe that every word of God is pure, we wanted to make sure that in our work, we were being consistent in preserving the consistency of how God is translated or, or used his words in the Bible uh, as much as language allows, of course. Languages are not copy and paste, so you can't just uh, port everything over in that way. But God is very specific with using certain words, and they convey doctrinal meaning. And so we wanted to make sure to have a system in in, in place to help us to be honest with our, 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 our work and to not conflate certain words and and be sure that we could keep the consistency. And so we took this uh, approach that instead of starting with translating the text right away, we would start with a words first approach, which is we would look at every word in the Bible. We'd make a list of all the words in the Bible. We would look at every word in, in the Bible, look at how God has used this word, gain an understanding. Before we looked at the dictionaries, of course, we work with, with dictionaries. That's that's uh, uh, part of, uh, of our work. But before we, we do that, we go to the Bible and see how is God using this word? Because God has the preeminence in all things, and he has the right and ex- exercises the right to use his words as he sees fit. So we took The whole Mm -hmm. text of the Bible, we made a list of all the words, and then we basically go word for word. We look up the word, we look it up in in the scriptures, trying to gain an understanding. We look up dictionaries, we look up other translations, we look up the etymology, we look up synonyms. So we work with all all the tools, but the, the primary focus is every word of God is pure, and we believe that. And so to help us with, with our work, to not conflate the words, because we believe the key to understanding Scripture is comparing Scripture with Scripture. And so if you're not careful in preserving the way God is using the, the, the words, you can have an accurate translation, but you may lose the ability to track the words the way God has set up. The Bible is, not, is a hyperlinked book. So every word mm-hmm. links to some something else. And so... Uh, our concern was that if we just started with the text, 
we would run into this problem with without having studied the words first. So we said, okay, let's let's uh, let's look at the words first. Let's study the words, and then when we're finished with with those, we'll jump into translating the text. So you know, I'm trying to visualize the way this this might look, and and so when you're talking about comparing scripture with scripture, what that means is uh, that you should be able to draw a line from one word and its usage to another place in scripture, how, how it's used uh, there, and then to another place in scripture, how, however many times that word is used, you should be able to draw a, a thin red line uh, to all of those points of usage in order to establish a, a firm definition um, or an understanding of, of what God means when he uses that word. And so what that produces uh, very naturally, rather than um, a, a storehouse of information or a linear process, you're, you're establishing a web of usage that will be informative at the point that you need to begin translating word for word. As you, as you move through the text in a linear fashion, you've got, you have a frame of reference that you can go to that will help inform in a very holistic way. That's, that's correct. So basically, most of the work is done up front. When, when we study the words and we're, we're spending the time understanding the words, how God uses them, we also make a, a definition because we're also doing a, a Bible dictionary. There's no Bible dictionaries in Albania, so th this will be a helpful tool. Uh, to to all in Al in Albania, even lost people, you know, they want to find out what what is this thing in the Bible? Mm -hmm. What is this word? What what is how what is it about? So since we're working with with the words, uh, we're also uh, studying uh, and 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 providing a dictionary. But most of the work is is up front. Once we're finished with the words, then going through the text is very clear because we don't have to stop and think, how am I going to translate this word? We have already done that work mm -hmm. up front. Can you give us maybe um, an example of why properly defining and categorizing specific words is important? Can you pull something out of your work that would help us to better understand why that approach has been superior? Sure. So, you know, f first thing, as I said, we wanted to, to make sure that we understood how God has defined uh, his words in the Bible. Uh, secondly, because we, we use we work at, at the word level and we look at every word. This has, uh, approach has helped us to create the, the Bible dictionary and write a definition, a biblical definition for that word. The third wor goal that we have in mind uh, when we work at the work, word level is to categorize each word in categories of things the Bible talks about. We don't make up the categories, but if the Bible addresses a certain topic, then we make a category of it. So right now mm. we have about... 400 categories of things the Bible talks about. So a word can fit in many uh, categories. And what this does is enables us to build some tools, search and study tools that are not easy to access otherwise. I think there, there's a big mm -hmm. area of, of studying the Bible and study tools in particular that just don't give you the ability to search in ways that with the tools and technology that we have today, we should be able to search for those things. Mm -hmm. And so each word is categorized in, in any of these uh, categories. We also um, work with each word to see if there's spelling variations on this word, especially with proper nouns. Sometimes you have Hebrew versus Greek, Old Testament, New Testament uh, spellings. And so, or somebody is just called with a different name. So we keep track of those. So let's say if you search for Elijah, you also get Elias, his, his New Testament mm -hmm. spelling and give you options to, to, to do that. And then we also work with word trees. So we built these trees of words that go together and we look at them, not only individual words, but we look at how they relate to each other because some concepts are, are, are big and they have 20, 30, 40 synonyms that go together. And if you don't see them together, before you start the translation, it's very easy to conflate those words because they're so similar. And you think, well, that's, that's mm -hmm. exactly what that means. And it may be accurate in the translation, but God went to a great 
a degree of detail to keep those separate and to give us a certain nuance of certain words. So we build the trees to, to make sure that it helps us not to, to, to conflate any words. So mm. let's go through a few examples. I, I think these may yeah, be bene beneficial. So the word submit in the, in, in the Bible, it's, it's always a positive word. It's always a word that is addressed to the party that is submitting to their authority or to one one another. Well, in the Albanian dictionary and in culture, not just the dictionary, but in culture, the word submit is equivalent to subdue. Or you might as well write the word abuse Be mm. because in our collective history of, let's say, 600 years, we, we were under the, the Ottoman Empire the Turks for 500 years. Then we gained independence in 1912. Well, then World War I started. And then after that, World War II started. Albania was invaded by the Nazis. And then we had a communist regime. We, we don't have in our collection as a nation a memory of somebody willing submitting to someone. <laughs> All of the examples mm -hmm. that we have is really abuse, somebody subduing us or in, in, in the family or in the culture. So when you use the word submit or when the Bible uses the, the word submit, I can't tell you the number of people throughout the years that have asked me, does the Bible teach abuse in, in marriage? And I say, where, where do you get that hmm. from? Where do you get that idea from? We'll say, well, Ephesians 5, it tells wives, submit yourselves to your husbands. And so, you know, we walk through the, through the passage that everything in that context, in that passage is positive. Christ submitted to the Father. The church submits to Christ. Christ loves the church, uh, and he gave himself for, for, for us. The husband is to love his wife as, as his own body, as Christ loved, loved the mm -hmm. church. So every example in that passage is positive. <laughs> you don't see abuse. In, in, but because that word has that connotation in culture, then our job is to provide a biblical definition if, uh, of this word. We're not going to shy away from the word just because the culture has twisted the meaning of, of that word or because sin mm -hmm. has made what he has made of, uh, of that word. We're going to provide a biblical definition. And we're going to give you examples. Here's what this means in the scripture. His word, here is what God says about this word. We are to submit to one another. We are to submit to our authorities. We are to submit in church or government or, you know, and then the husband and, and the wife to to the husband. So these are positive examples. They're not uh, negative examples. So this work of the dictionary is vitally important because things in the culture and, or the dictionary may be defined completely different. And so it's our job to say, okay, this is what the, the Bible say. There are other things that, that, are, that, that carry bad doctrine or certain connotations like the word baptism. Uh, you look up the word baptism in, in the dictionary, it doesn't go to the to the depth of the definition of what it means in the Bible to be baptized. Well, what is, bap what is baptism in the mm -hmm. Bible? There are several types of baptism in the Bible. Are you talking about the New Testament right. believers' water baptism? Are you talking about our baptism in Christ, which is a spiritual baptism? It's not a, a water baptism. Is John the Baptist baptism or Jesus' baptism? Those are all different types of baptism. So we list in, in the dictionary, we list all of them in the Bible and say, okay, here's this word, mm -hmm. search it out. So the way we have it li laid out in the, in the, uh, the website is that you can read the Bible and then for each word you can click and then get the biblical definition of that word. You have them side by side. So as people are reading and they may have questions about what is uh, a certain, the meaning of a certain word, they can just click on it and read uh, a full description and a biblical definition of, of what the word. The word mystery is another example. Well, a mystery in, in the, the worldly sense is just something that you can't find out. It's hard to, to find out what it is. But in the Bible, the mm -hmm. mysteries are something that are hidden to the world, but God has revealed those things to us. And so we, we, right. we go, th go through all the list of the mysteries in the Bible and what, what each of them represents in the Bible. So it's really a, bi a Bible study for every word in the Bible, if you, you, know, if you look at it that, that, that way. Well, that's wonderful. Now, now one of the, the most controversial, perhaps, aspects of, um, of, of the process that you're using is uh, probably, you know, from someone on the outside looking in, would be your use of the King James as, a, as a, one of the standards for translation. Uh, 
as well as maybe other translations, uh, the Italian translation, uh, st- the standard in Italian, I think is one you mentioned, but, but why not just the Greek and Hebrew, right? Like I think most, um, people in seminary and, the, and that kind of academic realm would, would challenge you and say, well, all you need is the Greek and Hebrew. Um, I really would love for you to explain why, um, the King James for you is a, is a, a standard on equal footing and how that kind of works. Okay. This question touches on several key concepts about the scripture. What is the scripture? Do we have the very words of God today? Where are they? What is God's role in bringing us his, his words today? So if you believe that the method of understanding the scripture is by comparing scripture with scripture, then from the translator's perspective, here's what that means from a translator. If you're going to translate from the original languages, we don't have the original autographs, but if you're going to translate from the original languages, you must be fluent in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Biblical Greek. Not only do you have to to be fluent in all of those three languages, but you must know the language to a degree when you can accurately determine what are the the, the respective words from one language to another. So you have to make a determination to keep the consistency of the words. And it means that you have to know those languages to that degree. And the, the mm-hmm. translation work and, and, the, work, uh, and the work of uh, looking up the manuscripts that are available is not a science. The textual criticism is very, very subjective. And it, mm-hmm. it shows in the examples of many Bible tra- translations. But what is, what is, is, is important to consider the biblical source, the text. So I think the word originals is a little misleading uh, when it refers to what is available to, to today, because when they talk mm-hmm. about the, the Greek and, and the Hebrew, especially about the New Testament, uh, there's over 5,000 manuscripts with important differences from one to the other, and they call those variants or variant readings. There, There's over 20 Greek texts there, there are produced. So it's not a matter of we only have, or we have the originals, we don't. We have only one Greek text. We don't have just one, one Greek text. And there are variants and, and differences between one and, and the other. And mm-hmm. so the, the issue becomes, what are, 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 you have to exercise faith in whatever conclusion you come about the scriptures. When we talk about us taking a, a faith-based view of the, of the Bible, well, pe- people that, that look at these manuscripts, they can say, uh, well, it's, it's too much. Nobody can determine. We don't have the originals. We don't have them, something to compare it to. So we can't make a determination for sure. And they g- just give up altogether and they say, well, you can't really know what God says. Others take mm-hmm. a different approach and they say, well, you know, they are similar, they are close to each other, so they can be reliable, but they can't just be 100% accurate. So they take Mm -hmm. the approach that that the Bible in in general is reliable, but then you need scholarship, you need people with with, uh, knowledge of the uh, ancient languages to help you understand certain parts of, of the Bible which you cannot know for sure if they're if they're reliable or not. So you, mm-hmm. they're still exercising faith. They're exercising faith in uh, the scholars, or they're exercising faith in, in faith in the method they've chosen to come with a conclusion of well, I want to know every word of God. And so right. the, the 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 more biblical view of applying a faith based approach would be that God has promised to preserve His words. It is not unbecoming of His character to do what he said, that he would preserve his words. Because what we see in the scripture when when we study his character is that God never gives us a commandment that he does not live up to himself. He is holy, so he tells us to be holy. He is love, Mm -hmm. and he tells us to to love one another. Well, in the Bible, we I've got a few examples here in Jeremiah. He tells Jeremiah 26.2, he says, all the words that I've commanded thee to speak unto them, uh, speak unto them, diminish not a word. God does not want people that preach his word or proclaim his word to diminish a single of his words. In Deuteronomy mm-hmm. 4, 2, he says, you shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command. So we, we see that God commands us to not 
add anything to his word, not take anything from, from, from his word. He tells us when we preach the word to not diminish any of his word. Is it too much to believe that God would live up to the same standard? Why would mm-hmm. he give us a standard to live up by if he doesn't hold his part of the, of the bargain, which is not really up to us? It's, it, it's his work and job to preserve his words and bring them to us. Yes, he uses people. Yes, people have to study. People have to learn. People have to spend time. Absolutely. But eventually, it is faith in his character that it is not unbecoming of him to really uh, preserve his, his, his words. So in, in, our, in our work, it, when we look at the King James Bible, we look at history. The, the proof is in the pudding. We look at what has God done with this work, with this book. Are there any other books in the history of mankind that match the spiritual fruit that has come from this book in the last 400 years? I would say more than 99% of the teaching, of biblical teaching that has made a difference in the life of churches and missions have come from people who have studied and preached and taught the King James Bible. That's an mm. undeniable fact. English mm-hmm. is not my, my, my native language, but that is a, a, a fact. So you look at the fruit, and when you compare it with other versions that come from, from different texts, you see that they are diminishing his words. You see that they're taken away from, from what, what God says. And so this idea of, uh, you know, only scholarship can make a determination, and, and, and that's the only way that, that we can know but still not know for sure. They don't want, they, they right. call our view an extreme view. <laughs> if you have, mm-hmm. if you believe that you have a book that contains all the words of God that are preserved for us today, they would consider that a, a extreme view. But in the Bible, when we look at the definitions of, okay, what is it, what does it take for somebody to know the words of God? We never find all the references that are made, like you mentioned, the last 150 years of the ways that they think people that have the authority to mm-hmm. make a determination, we see that in John seven seventeen it says, if, man, if any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. So it's not a matter of IQ. It's not a matter of how much you've studied. It's with the willingness to do his will. Uh, David writes in Psalm 119, I have more understanding than my teachers for thy testimonies are my meditation. He doesn't say, because I know Hebrew very well. But right. because he had that relationship with God. Amos 3.7 says, Surely the Lord will do nothing, but he revealeth his secrets unto his servants and prophets. And so we, we see that it is the relationship with God, the key to God revealing truth to us. It is not our IQ or our studies, even though we must study. Of course, we have a commandment to, to, to do that. But I think the approach of how you how you. Uh, begin a translation work is very important because Mm. if you look at it subjectively, even if you had the original autographs, you would still have to rely on a translation to make sense of what you're reading because you're going from one language to another. You have passages which are recorded in a certain language, Hebrew or Greek, which are a conversation, a translation of a conversation that happened in a different language, like Moses with Pharaoh, they certainly weren't, weren't speaking in Hebrew, or Joseph with, with his brothers, or even Jesus with his disciples. They were Jewish people. Why would they speak in Greek? So you don't get the originals. You don't get the original mm. language in what they spoke. But the Holy Spirit has no problem giving you a translation, a perfect translation yeah. from one, one, one language to, to another. And so yeah, the, advantage of the, King, the advantage of the King James is that you have it all in one language, and then you can work with comparing scripture with scripture, because that is the ultimate goal of, of a translator who is doing a, a, a good work with the translation, is to produce something that people can follow the individual words and study the Bible for themselves. Hi, I'm James Fife. I'm a faculty professor of missiology at Living Faith Bible Institute. And I would just like to take a minute to invite all of you uh, to consider signing up for 
really any of the classes, but especially our missions courses. We put a focus on uh, training and equipping believers, both biblically and in the local church and practically uh, to, to do the work that God has called us to. I've done it. I've been on the mission field myself uh, in a number of different capacities and in different countries. And so we speak both from uh, a biblical perspective, but also from uh, an experienced perspective. You get that same thing across the curriculum in missions and really across the broader curriculum in LFBI. Please consider joining us and uh, allowing God to, to lead you and get equipped for the work that he's called you to. Visit lfbi.org for any questions or to enroll, and I will see you in class. So maybe you can give us an example of of how the English uh, authorized version translation provides an illuminated understanding of the Greek and the and the Hebrew text. And and so again, we're not diminishing what we have available to us in the Greek and the Hebrew. I, I think um, would be a point you want to make. But what we believe is that that the the KJV uh, as the widely held standard for four hundred some odd years um, provides for a supplementary information that illuminates the text in a, in a way. And, uh, you provided, you know, you provided at the conference, uh, uh, several really good examples. One that I loved was the Luke 23 example, but, but whatever you could provide us, uh, just in terms of how we might understand how you use this and how you understand this in the midst of the translation process itself. Sure. So let, let's go a few, uh, a few examples for the word, for instance, the word follower in the Bible, first Corinthians 11, one, Paul says, be followers of me. Uh, Ephesians 5 1 says the same thing, followers of me. Th that word in the Greek, it's G3402, mimetes, is the word for mimicking something. It's the word for a somebody who imitates. And that is how this word has been rendered in a lot of English, modern English translations, it's been rendered mm. as imitators. Because that is the, the, the meaning of the Greek word. So when the King James translators came to this word, they rendered it as followers instead of imitators. And this is consistent with the way this, this word has been used in the Bible. Jesus told his disciples, follow me. He didn't say imitate me. He said, follow me. Paul tells the Corinthians and the Ephesians, uh, follow, follow me, be followers of me. In Hebrews 13, it talks about to remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow. So I think the, the, the King James rendering of this word is a lot better than saying an imitator. And I think mm -hmm. the modern Bibles have done a great disservice to our generation to raise up a generation of believers who are imitators, but they're not followers. The devil is an imitator. Mm -hmm. We're not imitators. So of course, the, the yeah. King James translators knew what this word meant. They had a, a dictionary of the Greek. It's not like, you know, you, you mm -hmm. hear pastors all the time correct the King James and say, well, this word should have been translated he differently here because, you know, he opened up a right. dictionary and he looked it up at the word. Well, you don't think 47 people looked that up, <laughs> that word, when they were <laughs> translating the King James? They had dictionaries. They knew what that word meant. So if you divorce, if you divorce God from the process of preservation, and bring in his words even to us today that you're going to use human logic. And when you use human logic, you're going to say, well, you know, people make mistakes and these scribes, they, you know, they, they went to sleep when they were writing and they wrote something and somebody else took that to mean that. So that's all human reasoning. Where is God in all of this? Mm -hmm. So I think this particular one right. is 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 a better is a better rendering, and it brings clarity, and it has practical implications because we're not to imitate people, but we are to follow. That's what we're called to do. Another one is mm -hmm. uh, G twenty forty uh, ergates. That's the word in in Hebrew, in Greek. Sorry, and that uh, one word that has been rendered in English as three words: workers, laborers and workmen. And the word worker is 99% of the time is associated with workers of iniquity. That's the, the phrase that has, has been used. The word laborer mm. is a New Testament word, and it's always connected directly or in picture with the gospel. Laborers in the field. 
The mm. field is the world, given the gospel, or co-laborers with with with, with uh, Christ or with Paul. It's always in the context of ministry and the gospel, particularly. But a workman mm. is someone who is highly skilled at what he does. Everywhere you, you read in the Bible, that word workman is always associated from the tabernacle to the temple, to people who work with their hands to make special, special things. These are workmen. And then in 2 Timothy 2.15, we are called to be a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. That means that God's calling to everyone, every Christian, not just the pastors, is to be workmen, to be the best they can be at learning the Bible, studying the Bible, and rightly dividing the Bible. So you have one Greek word, but the King James gives you three different contexts of how a worker in general mm -hmm. shows up, and it can show up in different ways. And what it takes to be, if you're saved, you should be a laborer. You should work in the field. It doesn't take any skill. Just share your testimony. <laughs> but to be a workman, mm -hmm. you have to study, and you have to rightly divide the word of truth. So I think this is an example where you can gain something from seeing how this word has been rendered in, in the King James. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it brings me back to the, the concept that you're using in the way that you're categorizing the words that you define. Uh, you're creating those kind of uh, baskets for words to go into in a very similar way. The King James translators translated words with the intention of categorizing them for our understanding, whether it be labor or workman, et cetera, uh, it helps us as readers to begin to classify the way that we see certain words uh, to give us an understanding of how they apply to our life. That's correct. That's exactly right. Do you want more examples or are we good? <laughs> yeah, please. Yeah. These are really fun to me. I mean, I, I really enjoyed this. Well, there's this word, uh, evildoer, has been translated evildoer, G2555, kakapois in, in Greek. It has been translated evildoer uh, everywhere in the Bible, except for John 18.30, when it talks about Christ. Uh, and they when they deliver him before Pilate, they say, if he were not a malefactor, we would not have delivered him up unto thee. So in this mm -hmm. particular instance, the King James translators break the rule of how they translate this word, Kakopois in, 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 in Greek. And instead of translating evildoer like they've done everywhere else, they use the word malefactor. Well, when you use when you look up the word malefactor and you see that this is a Latin based word, well, it means a criminal, somebody who has been convicted of a crime. And that's what maleficia is, and that's where even in in uh, English we get similar words. So the context is they are talking to a Roman, and they speak to him in, in Latin terms, in Latin law terms, and they say to him that this guy is a criminal. You should treat him, prosecute him as a convicted criminal. They're not just saying he's an evildoer in the sense that everybody does some bad things. No, they're very particular about the word that they use to a Roman to tell him because they couldn't convict him based on their own law, their Hebrew law. Right. So they go to right. a Roman and they speak speak to him in his legal terms and they try to convict, to have him uh execute Christ uh, as as a, a, a criminal. And so it's very interesting that they break this pattern and they don't use a Greek word, but they use a Latin based word, which gives you a different context for all, all of our Western law is based on Roman law. So this gives mm -hmm. you a, a, a really enlightened rendering if you study that word and know that how that word has, has, has been has been used. It's not bad to say evil doers, certainly not wrong. They've translated it that way. But I think when they break break that pattern, there's a reason for it. Whether they were right. conscious of this or not, I don't know. But when I study it, I see that whenever something seems off, if you believe it's God's preserved word, then you will find a revelation. The skeptics will find a mistake. You will find a revelation. Right, right. Yeah, that's really good. Um, now, one of the things that you talked about in your lecture was the the distinction distinction between the concept of language and a tongue in the KJV. And, and you mentioned that, that only the KJV uh, renders these two words uh, as distinct uh, conceptually. And so... Um, Maybe you can give us some insight into that and then how that speaks to the, the translation process itself and, and your overall philosophy. Okay, so the, the word in Greek is dialecticos, like dialectic, 
uh, and it's been translated as a language or tongue. So the King James makes a difference in the sense that language is more than a particular tongue. So when we're talking about a tongue, we're talking about a specific language, Albanian, English, French, and so forth. But language is more than just a specific tongue. It includes the tongue, but it's also identity and culture and uh, rituals and things that pertain to the identity of this group of people who are speaking this language. So you can have different mm -hmm. groups of people speak the same language, uh, same tongue, but they don't have the same uh, beliefs. They don't have the, the same traditions. They don't have the same identity in, uh, even though they speak the same tongue. So why this becomes important is because of the word of the, the usage of the word language in the Bible. It's very important because it first shows up in Genesis chapter 11. It says the whole world was of one language and of one speech. And that was the Tower of Babel. And we know what, what happened there. Uh, they were of one mm. speech, but they were not of one mind. And God is not happy with what they're, they're trying to do is build a name for themselves. And so he confounds their, their, their language. And then the last time the word language is used is in Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, the context is that they are of one mind and one accord in the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit does a work in Acts chapter 2 where he translates the message of the words of God that are being preached into the language of all the hearers. And I think there's mm. like 21 different nationalities that are mentioned there. And they're hearing the very words of God through the work of the Holy Spirit in their own language and in their own tongue. So why this becomes important, this distinction, is because, again, if we believe that God has the right and exercises the right to define his words, then we see that how the, that, that word language is defined is really in two models. If you believe in the preservation of the Bible, you will see God do a work through the Holy Spirit, like in Acts chapter 2, to bring the words of God mm -hmm. into the language of all the people. That's his, that's his desire. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. If you don't believe that, if you don't believe that God will preserve his words, you will end up into the Genesis 11 model. You will mm. end up in an ecumenical movement where all let's all come together and let's lay aside all our differences, including Bible translations. Let's all agree that there's no perfect standard, but they, they're all talking the same language and the uh, and the same speech. And that doesn't it doesn't refer just to the fact that they speak in one particular tongue. It refers to the concept of what they believe about how they, they should conduct themselves, which is to build mm. a name for themselves. And I, I believe if you, if you look at the history of the critical texts, Westcott and Hort, Nestle Aland, and the UBS, I think that is definitely an ecumenical effort by rejecting a final authority, which God set up in the King James Bible. Mm, yeah, that's really powerful and, and, and super and, and very interesting study um, that I think that is beneficial for us to consider. The, the thing that I'm, I'm hearing in that is that uh, the necessity of unity for, uh, you know, precision and um, for the sake of understanding God's very words versus unity uh, surrounding the ambiguity that comes with an ecumenical age and a, sort of a, a tolerance of all things and in order to um, build, a build a tower unto yourself versus yeah. a, a, a work unto the Lord. It's really a, a fascinating uh, thing that you've, that you've looked at there. Um, explain for for the listeners how how you move from the establishment of a dictionary to the grammatical contextual synthesis required in the translation itself. So now you've got this kind of network, this web of information. What does it look like for you to begin implementing that in terms of kind of the Albanian grammatical system? Once we're finished with the words, and uh, right now we have. 50 words left. So in the next couple of days, we're finishing all the words and the uh, uh, dictionary, wow. about 10,500 words in the dictionary. Uh, 
then we moved into, tr into the translation. We have already resolved how each word will be translated everywhere. And so we've, we've made some tools. That's why I, I mentioned the computer skills. They, they come, on, come in handy. Uh, we've, we've built a tool that helps us to put together all the work that we've done from the translation. It pulls it. And then for each verse of the Bible, it gives you all the work that you have done in a way, in a way that all you have to do is fix the grammar basically, and then you can you can complete your, your translation. So it doesn't mm. automatically do a translation for you, but it, it makes it uh, accessible to you to bring all the work that you've done with dictionaries, alternate spellings, every, every, everything for each verse. And so you can walk through each verse and just fix the grammar and move along because you've already done all the work up, up front. You don't need to think how, how am I going to translate this verse or, or this particular work. So this, this, that is the process. It's a tool that we built because we didn't find something that uh, uh, was specifically designed with that uh, viewpoint in mind. So we build all, all of our tools ourselves and uh, that's, that's what we're using. And so the way, just so I can better understand it. So it's built so that it plug, it's like a plug and play. So everything finds its proper place and then it gives you the ability uh, to have kind of a foundation to work from. Then you walk through it and you determine um, uh, if it, if it's functioning the way that it should, uh, you're yeah. saying you're saying this is the way the punctuation should work, and then you begin to massage the text in a way that is also comparative. You're you're Correct. still going back to these other sources that you are that are reliable and trustworthy, and then you're yep. massaging the text until it actually um, tr translates fully into to the Albanian um, uh, grammatical parts of speech system. That's correct. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's great. And so theoretically this same tool could be used uh, as long as someone was willing to create the word bank. Um, it could be used for, for any language. Um, I mean, how, how flexible does this tool become over time if other people want to do something similar? Uh, I, I can only speak for Latin based languages. I, I think this will be an excellent tool for, for that purpose. I'm not familiar with uh, Eastern languages, Chinese, Japanese, or uh, mm -hmm. all, all, all the East. Uh, so I, I don't know how their, their grammar works and their uh, words work and the rules for that. So I, I don't know if it'll work for all, all languages, but I know for Latin based uh, languages, it, it will certainly, it will certainly work. And so where does the work stand? It's going to be a website, but also an app. Uh, what are you calling yes. the tool? Explain some of those things, the, the practical things uh, for the listener. We haven't released a name yet, so I can't I can't make that available. Okay. Uh, w what we're calling it, uh, but so w we have spent two and a half years going through each word, and then writing up a dictionary, a Bible study for for each word. That, there's there's a lot of work that that has gone into that. So in a couple of days we'll finish that, and then we'll jump into into the translation. Lord willing, by the end of summer we will finish the the New Testament. And so that, mm. and then we'll make that available online, and then we will invite our our pastors back in Albania to uh, take a look at it and give us feedback while we start working on the on the old Old Testament. So that's that's uh, about where we are right now. So this is a major milestone for us, being able to to reach the end of the 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 words and and the dictionary. How do you imagine at the point that, you know, you sounds like you're going to do kind of a soft launch with, uh, with trusted believers in Albania, but then, uh, at the point that you, that you do a broader, um, launch of the, the software, um, what do you imagine that looking like? Uh, how do you, how are you hoping that the people will engage with the, the resource? So our, our goal is to put it in print and hopefully give out as, as many Bibles as, as we can, uh, print and and people help us with with the printing process. Uh, we want to we have a website uh, that we're finishing up. We're going to have an app, uh, and Lord willing, we'll also make an audio recording of that. We we expect people to engage in in all these ways. There's a lot of Albanians that live outside of Albania that we may not be able to reach directly through physically giving them a, a Bible. There's you know of course Kosovo, which is next to Albania, 99 percent Albanian, two, uh, two million Albanians that live there. Uh, Montenegro is about 500,000. North Macedonia, 
uh, another million or so. Greece mm. has a lot of Albanians, over ha half a million. Italy as well. Many in the U.S. There, there are scattered Albanians all, all over the world, which will make use of the digital products, the the website, uh, because it has all the study tools, and we build it in a way that I study when I when I'm preparing a a, a message, uh, and also the the app. So we. We first will will make the New Testament available only to our pastors, uh, and then we come out with everything. So we don't want to release anything until we come out with everything: the the website, mm -hmm. the app, and the and the Bible in in print. Make those available, and hopefully have some churches interested that would partner with us to say, "Hey, we'll send a team over for a week and give out Bibles and uh, evangelize." That I think that would be a great great thing to accompany the uh, the translation that that sounds uh, amazing and i'm hoping that the fellowship will really uh, have an opportunity to get behind that and and support that and maybe you'll come back on the show at the point that we, we you launch everything and we can talk about how it's going that would be wonderful too yeah yeah that'd be great um, kind of as we close out the episode, obviously there's a million things that we could talk about in terms of the topic of preservation and um, how what you're doing uh, the implications of that on what you're doing. But uh, so many of our listeners are Bible students, um, and many of which are in the Bible Institute. If you were to just express in closing, um, really what, you know, uh, young students, young leaders in the church uh, need to know, need to consider, uh, both philosophically, but also doctrinally, as they move forward in their faith, uh, that would keep them from compromising on the, the words of truth that we have, the certainty of the words that we have, what would you, what would you say to them? Well, you know, after I got saved, I, you know, Jeff discipled me and taught me how to study the Bible. And I, I really got into studying the Bible. So I've been teaching and preaching the Bible for, for 30 years. And I can tell you that in these last two years, we have seen things that I had never seen before. And I'm not new to the scriptures. I've been I've been teaching them for 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 many years. I think the depth of what God has preserved in the King James Bible is unfathomable. What God has done with this book, the things that we have been able to see, and God has revealed to us as we're studying each word and paying attention to each word and comparing and seeing why is God breaking a pattern here and why is this 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 way? Why is it rendered this way? Uh, I would say trust the book. Don't you have no need to compromise. This is God's hand. God's hand is all over this thing and trust it, believe it, preach it. And God will give you the revelation and the knowledge that, that you need for your for your own walk and to help others also. If I were to start this work all over again, I wouldn't do it otherwise. Now, when we started, mm. when we started, we had an idea. This is; these are the reasons. These are the motives. This is the approach we're taking. But we had really no idea what uh, all of that was going to entail. Uh, now that we're at this point, uh, you know, I, I think that looking back, if we had to start it all over again, we would definitely see it this way. We see, mm. we compare other versions as well. We see where if they had used this process, it would have been very beneficial to them to make different choices in certain verses. And so it has helped us tremendously. So I would greatly encourage everyone, trust trust the word of God. He has given it to you. Don't let go of it. Arian, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for sharing uh, this wonderful gift uh, with us. And uh, we are praying with you that this would have a an incredible impact on Albania, but that also the tool long term would prove to be helpful in in other translation works. And, and we're very, very grateful for what God has done in your lives and and uh, and what that means for really for his mission in the world. So thank you so much. Thanks for the invitation. I, I appreciate the opportunity to present this work. And we want to thank you as well, the listener. Uh, we're grateful for you and we're thankful for the time that you spent with us today. Arian captured so perfectly uh, what our heart would be uh, as a Bible Institute and as a fellowship to you is that, is that you, can, you can trust the word of God uh, for yourself. You can know that you have a preserved word in your language and, and, and you shouldn't be um, dismayed uh, or discouraged by the fact that uh, that is a rare view. 
uh, that many people hold to a different perspective on God's word. And, and they might even uh, shame you for uh, believing that the King James is the preserved word of God and inerrant and infallible. But don't let that bother you. Uh, trust what the Lord has done. Uh, trust the uniqueness of the text. Study it with all that you have. Compare scripture with scripture and let God tell you for himself what he thinks. And, uh, and that will build your faith. Uh, we love you so much. We're grateful for the time that you spent with us, but we also want to invite you to join us in LFBI. If you visit lfbi.org, you can see all the classes that we offer as a school. Uh, credits are only $40 a credit hour. It's very uh, inexpensive, and, and uh, we are trying to provide you with resources, instructors, teachers, uh, that are making use of what they're teaching, uh, practitioners of the faith, if you will. And, uh, and so we have wonderful professors that are teaching our classes. One of the classes that seems appropriate for me to mention uh, with an episode like this is the manuscript evidence course that Dr. Alan Shelby teaches in the Bible Institute, where he talks about the preservation of God's word, the history of translation, and why we can know that the authorized version is uh, a preserved word in English for us today. And so if that interests you, uh, please check out lfbi.org, learn more about our, our courses and our lineup. But with all that said, uh, again, we're grateful for you and we can't wait to see you again next week for another episode of The Postscript. God bless. Thanks for listening to The Postscript. If you enjoy the show, please leave us a rating and review in order to help other people find our podcast. If you value this show, please help us continue creating content by supporting Living Faith Bible Institute at lfbi.org support.